Take your Bibles tonight. Take your Bibles tonight. Let's go over to Revelation chapter 9, please. Revelation chapter 9. Get myself untangled here. I want to look at tonight the study of names. We read in the Bible a lot of names. There's actually 29 names given to Satan. And the key is, as we were talking yesterday, and as the gentleman was saying, the Hebrews put great importance on the meanings of names. They are very much a traditionalist, passing on generations. He said, it is our way as a memoriam to remember those that have left this earth. And he asked a question. He says, why do we as North Americans have no importance on meanings of names? He said, you think of some of these. He said, I have to admit, some of my relatives, I don't know where they pick their names from. He says, and why they would call their girls and boys some of these names, I have no clue. He says, I am named after my grandmother, except they shortened it and made it a boy's name. My son is named after my father. My father was named after his grandfather. And he says, and to this day, he says, do you know why we do this? And I did. And I told him, I said, you do this. He says, you do know Jewish history. I said, that's part of Bible college. You got to know what you preach. You got to know what you teach. And as you look at things, Satan's names are important because they symbolize his character. They symbolize what his motives are. And let's be honest, 29 glimpses into his diabolical character is pretty important. Like I was saying this morning, another gentleman where a volunteer said that Satan is all of us. The devil is all of us. Oh, wouldn't you like to believe that one? You know? And he says, you know, that old song, The Devil Inside. And I said, we won't go there. The devil is alive and well. The Bible tells us in Job 1 and 2 that he's walking to and fro. The Bible tells us in Peter that he's walking around as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. We know that his minions, his demons are everywhere influencing people, possessing people. We know that the Bible calls, and we'll be there in a bit, that he's the prince and piety of the air. He's the God of this world. These are some of his names. Who do you think is influencing this hate? This division, this animosity to right. I have never in my life seen so much animosity to anybody that does right. And for those that do evil, praise and glory. You know, you read about in the Bible where they shall call evil good and good evil. But somehow when I was a kid, I never thought it'd be in my lifetime. But watching people, and I was talking to somebody again yesterday, and they were downplaying the good and calling them bad. And I says, how can you literally say that with the facts out there? You're willing to believe a lie over the truth because you're blinded about this. Literally, to be able to see and becoming acquainted with Satan requires a review of his various names to see what he's capable of. Satan, the word Satan means adversary. What do you think he's doing with Christianity? Helping us? Enabling us? No. Devil, the Hebrew word for devil is slander. What does he do? He slanders. What is our world today? Anything that's good, they slander it. They make light of it. This is by far the most frequent terms used of Satan is the devil and Satan. But others are also 
there to warn us of his intentions and activities. Tonight, we'll try to get through a few of them, but I want us to see the importance of it. In Revelation chapter 9 and verse 11, deals with three of his names. And Revelation 9, 11, the Bible says, And they had a king over them, which is the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in the Hebrew tongue is Abaddon. But in the Greek tongue hath his name Apollyon. Here is three references to the same person. Abaddon, king of the bottomless pit, and Apollyon. Probably, I would say, Lori can correct me, fourth or fifth year in our ministry, we had a gentleman come to our church, and he said his name was Apollyon. And I've never had anybody get up in the middle of service and shake his feet off and make a big ordeal and stomp out. And I was actually preaching about the devil that time. And I got a lengthy letter. It was long. It was a book about how when I was preaching, there was black demons coming out of my mouth. And all of this, and he was Apollyon, the messenger of God. I'm like, whoa, what Bible is he reading? Because Apollyon is the destruction king. And I'm thinking, wow. But when he and his family walked in, everybody in church felt something wrong. And he said when he opened up psalm books, the demons were coming out of it. There was demons all around the platform. And I'm thinking, yeah, of course they're all around the platform. I'm preaching about the king of the demons. But as to being filled with one, don't think so. But when he called himself Apollyon, the messenger of God, that just made my skin crawl. That letter was short-lived in my hands, and it met my fireplace real quick. I did not even keep it because, to me, that was full of lies and demonic influence. But this Bible tells us what the devil is, and nowhere in the Bible is Apollyon and God equal or the same. They are opposites because the Bible says here, Abaddon. And as we look at the first one tonight, let's open with a word of prayer and add God's wisdom and protection as we preach about our adversary. Heavenly Father, use this word, I pray, as we become aware of the tactics, the characters, and the diabolical names that you have listed for Satan and what he's capable of. Would you hide us behind the cross tonight? Would you protect us as this church, as we learn and we stand on guard against our adversary, the accuser and slanderer of the brethren? Help us, Lord, to stand for truth, no matter how difficult it is. May we stand on the Word of God. Use this, I pray. Guard my words in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Number one, I want you to look at the first word that is mentioned, Abaddon. As it also says here, we'll be looking at the next word, Apollyon. It is a transliterate Hebrew word, and it's normally associated with death and destruction. It is actually in Job chapter 26, verse 6. Job 28, verse 22, Job 31, verse 12, Psalms 88, verse 11, Proverbs 15, 11, and Proverbs 27, verse 20, all deal with the exact transliterated Hebrew word, death and destruction. This is what the devil, what do you think Jesus led the captives free? He refers to the angel of death. He refers to Satan as death. And notice how he says death and hell. They're synonymous. And if you look at, let's turn over to Job chapter 26 and verse 6. And we'll look at a couple of these verses here. Job chapter 26, please. Job 26 and verse 6. Hell is naked before him, and destruction 
hath no covering. When you look at these words here, destruction is the same Hebrew word as what we would see as Abaddon. One of the things that you will notice as you look over in chapter 28 and verse 22, a couple pages over, the Bible says here, destruction and death say, we have heard the fame thereof with our ears. Destruction and death. And as you see, anything Satan touches leads to destruction, leads to death. Look at how he stirs up people. You know, I, I was reading an article the other day about someone writing. And it really grieved my heart because you could see the devil's hand all over this. A petition to abolish all of the police forces in Canada. To say that they lead to more death and destruction and to do away with them, our communities would be a better place. <laughs> New York just tried that. They abolished their crime unit. Crime went up 47%. And now the black community is saying, please bring back the police force. Those people that are advocating for the NYPD to disband are not living in our communities. And what was the call for? A one-year-old girl was shot through the walls. Minneapolis crime has gone up through the ceiling. Chicago's crime is even worse than it was before. Folks, if law is gone, there will be no order. And this is what the devil, it's not destruction. How in the world can you shoot someone, a young lady for saying all lives matter, and four people gun someone down? Is God only concerned about one race? No. For God so loved the world. What would possess someone to kill children? What would possess someone to not think of life, but someone that is advocating death and destruction? The devil. I read some of these news stories about some of these people that don't get headline news. Many of you probably didn't even hear about the three elderly ladies coming back from a church thing and a black Muslim killed them in a truck stop with a knife. One of the four lived and the deaths were literally horrific. But here's what's sad. No one did a thing. They heard the screams, but no one did a thing. Where is humanity? Where is humanity? Death and destruction. That's all I'm seeing around. And we're calling it peaceful? Death and destruction. This is what the devil lives for. <clears throat> he loves to destroy God's kingdom. From the very beginning, destruction. Notice it wasn't. But of hundreds of years, not quite even a thousand years before God's creation was so polluted that God himself said the spirit of God will not live with man. And the flood came. It had got so wicked. Look at the death and destruction of nations. Look at some of the things the Persians in envisioned in their torture. Look at some of the things the Romans dreamed up. The Egyptians. The nomadic tribes of the Middle East. And this is just, look at some of the things that we read today of people doing to people. How can you think this way? But if you're not possessed or influenced by the king of death and destruction. He doesn't care about humanity. He hates them. It is very apparent. That the devil hates mankind. 
And we see this. And the church is just like so passe about it. These are God's creation. And God loves them. And he wants us to be the ones that Jude 22 says. Some having compassion. Are we going to be those ones that have compassion for those that know? Do you realize that most of the people are so blinded they don't see what they're even doing themselves? They're so used. And they're just talking to some people makes me frustrated. Like, hello? <laughs> Do you not even see what you're doing? And it's okay. But if you advocate good, you're evil. We see our politicians standing by and watching these people tear down our threads of our society with no problem. Evil. Now, being buried in the news is the evil of men and women, what they've done to children over these last two decades. And the news is not even willing to cover it. Isn't that a shame? Powerful men and women across the world Death and destruction. But notice what the Bible says in Revelation 9-11. The second one I want you to see is the angel of the bottomless pit. Revelation chapter 9, back to verse 11. And they had a king over them, which is the angel of the bottomless pit. I've read many commentators, and a lot of them want to say that this is a different angel. No, this is one and the same. There's only one king. Of the demons. Bottomless pit. And the word here is denoting someone that's the keeper of the bottomless pit. Usually the king is over everything. We have the king of kings, the lord of lords. He's over it all. But we have the king of the bottomless pit. As much as Michael is the author in Revelation chapter 12 verse 7. King, Satan is the king of the abyss. There are demons. Do you realize you do not want to go there? Luke chapter 8. They don't even want to go there. They know it's waiting for them. Luke chapter 8 and verse 31, please. Luke chapter 8 and verse 31. And they besought him that he would not command them to go into the deep. Please send us anywhere. How about this swine? But don't send us into the abyss. And that's what they, the Greek word is for deep here, the abyss. Please don't, don't send us there. We don't want to go there. There are demons in the abyss who will be released by Satan for a short time. In Revelation chapter 9. And the fifth angel in verse 1 sounded and I saw a star fall from heaven. Under the earth, and to him was given the key of the bottomless pit. And he opened the bottomless pit, and there rose a smoke out of the pit, as the smoke of a great furnace. The sun and air were darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit. And there came out of the smoke locusts under, upon the earth uh, to them that was given power, as the scorpions on the earth have power. And it was commanded them that they should not hurt the grass of the earth, neither any green thing neither any tree, but only those men which have not the seal of God in their foreheads. I don't know what it is, but I don't know how many demons are out there, but the Bible says they have the power of the scorpions of the earth, the sting of them, and they come out as the locusts upon the earth. And they have free reign. Aren't you glad you're not here? I've seen the power of demons in Haiti. I've seen things, I've heard things that I still will never forget. My dad's seen it. Can you imagine the star, which is referring to Satan, opening the abyss, and these ones that have been locked in there are let out on mankind, and people don't want to take it serious? Wow. I'm so glad that in a twinkling of an eye, we won't have to be around when that happens. The angel of the bottomless pit. They must be bad angels. I mean really bad angels to be confined there. 
But notice what the Bible says. Some demons have been confined there for a considerable portion of human history and will not be released until the final judgment. Turn over to Jude chapter 6, please. Jude chapter 6. This is another reference to there. And the angels which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, he everlasting chains under darkness, under the judgment of the great day. There are some that will not be until the great judgment. This is keys. This millennial, they will be released and cast directly in the lake of fire. But Satan will be imprisoned in the abyss for a short time. And you think a thousand years, that's a short time. Eternity is a whole lot longer, amen, when he gets cast away. Revelation chapter 20, please. Revelation chapter 20. In verse 1. And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit, and a great chain in his hand. Aren't you glad God has the master keys? And he laid hold on the dragon and the old, that old serpent. I like how he says that old serpent. Which is the devil and Satan and bound him a thousand years. And cast him in the bottomless pit and shut him up. And set a seal upon him that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years should be fulfilled. And after that he must be loosed a little season. And I saw the thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus, and for the word of God, which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. You think about this. They finally are at peace for a thousand years. Satan is tied, cast in, and God puts a seal that no one can break. You're not touching this place for a thousand years. But I love the last part. After that, he must be loosed a little season. This time he is on a short leash. I don't know how long, but a little season... The Bible is chapter 20 and verse 21. He's on his final judgment at the end of chapter 20, excuse me. And 21, a new heaven and a new earth is made. So that was just a little chapter. How long he has to deceive man before God finally casts him into his permanent residence in the lake of fire. But we know that right now he is living out his destruction and his death. But one day, he will be imprisoned and mankind will have a reprieve from deception, from death and from destruction for a thousand years. And then, he comes out, deceives, and will be vanquished, finally and forever. And man, as they know it, will be at peace forevermore. No more Satan, no more temptation. And as Revelation 21 says, no more death. Death is finished forever. But notice the third see in the last part of chapter 9. The Bible says that but in the Greek tongue hath his name Apollyon. This name represents the Greek parallel to the Hebrew Abaddon. Best translated destroyer. Not only is it death and destruction but the Greek word for this one is he is a destroyer look at all that he's done the world was perfect he was not happy until man fell into sin and was destroyed everything he does he destroys look at men's lives look at the things we destruction misery it's what he It only appears one of 
bottomless pit. We see him named once as Apollyon. And this is the only verse. Destroyer. But it fits him perfect. How did he touch Job's life? Did he want to edify him? No. He wanted to destroy him. He wanted to tear down the basic fabrics of his life so that he would curse God. That was his only purpose. If I can do this, and boy, did he do it. Think about what he did. The cruelest thing he could have done was take Job's grown children. Just shows you how much he doesn't really care about life. So he took the animals. They didn't die. Notice he didn't kill any of the animals. But they killed the servants. And then he caused a great wind to fall. One thing after. Then he takes the health of Job. He's going to do everything and to destroy everything he touches. We've got to be on guard for that because the devil is a destroyer. Fourthly, I want you to see Beelzebub. Matthew chapter 12. Probably one of the most humorous stories in the New Testament was the Pharisees in all their infinite wisdom accused the Lord Jesus Christ of casting out in the name of Beelzebub. <laughs> if they would have known anything, but the Lord comes back to them in Matthew chapter 12, in verse 24. The Bible says, And when the Pharisees heard it, they said, This fellow doth not cast out devils, but by Beelzebub, the prince of the devils. I love verse 25, don't you? And Jesus knew their thoughts and said unto them, Every kingdom divided against itself is brought into desolation, and every city or house divided against itself shall not stand. And if Satan cast out Satan, he is divided against himself. How shall then his kingdom stand? And if I by Beelzebub cast out devils, by whom do your children cast them out? Therefore they shall be your judges." What a good, he just throws that right back in their face. So who do your children cast out devils from? If I'm doing it by Beelzebub, who are you doing it by? But if I cast out devils by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God is come unto you. There's the whole caveat of it. If I cast it out by the Spirit of God, then you know the kingdom of God is coming unto you. But the whole purpose of the Pharisees was to deny and even today, Judaism denies that the Messiah has come. Oh, they know about Jesus. All this other thing. Very great conversation. Knew all about Jesus. Knew exactly where. Did all the things. Was very reverential. But that's not the Messiah. But folks, he is the Messiah. As we see what this means, this means the Lord After arguing that Satan would not oppose demons because they would be self-defeating, Jesus acknowledged that while Satan was strong, in Luke chapter 11, verse 21, he himself was far stronger in, Reve in Luke chapter 11, verse 22, and would prevail. Let's turn there, please. Luke chapter 11, Luke chapter 11, verse 21 and 22. Luke chapter 11. When a strong man armed keepeth his palace, his goods are in peace. But when a stronger than he shall come upon him and overcome him, he taketh from him all his armor wherein he trusteth, and divided his spoils. <clears throat> the Lord Jesus Christ has a way of using analogies that was plain and simple and down to earth. And God used his son to explain to the Pharisees about something simple we all know about, thieves and the strongers. And using the analogy of the Romans around them 
of how the Roman nation came in and conquered Jerusalem. And he says, But when a stronger than he shall come upon him and overcome him, he taketh from all his armor, wherein he trusted and divided his spoils. He's basically saying, Don't worry, I'm stronger than Satan. And we know that. Because the Bible says, Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. If God be for you, who can be against you? A good question for Christians to remember that we are on the winning side. Beelzebub, we notice that he is classified the Lord Prince. But also, number five, in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4, we will notice that he's referred to as the God of this world. There doesn't need to be definition for that one because we know he's the God of this world. Because of all the corruption, all the lies, all of the sensuality and sin that is out there today, and the permissiveness for evil can only be led by one person. In whom, in verse 4, the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which would believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is in the image of God, should shine unto them. He's doing his almighty best to keep men blinded in darkness. Why do you think he deals in so much lies? So much lies is told you begin to believe it is the truth. And the greatest lie is that all religions lead to heaven. And that's what he panders the most. So many times in the last few months talking to people you have your way, I have my way. No, I, I don't have my way. I'm sorry. It's not my way. It's the word of God's way. He is the way, the truth, and life. I am the door. No man can come to the Father if they do not go through Jesus Christ. Period. And this is what people, but, but yeah, I, you know, I, I do my masses. I do this. I do that. I don't care what you do. If you do not come through the name of Jesus Christ, whereby all men must be saved in the book of Acts, you're not getting to heaven. And the greatest analogy I use, I said, I don't care who you are, if you're my friend, if you come through my door at 2 o'clock in the morning, you're going back out through the door. And it's not going to be in a nice way. I said, I'm your friend, but if I come to your door and open it up at 2 o'clock in the morning, how well are you going to receive me? He says, you'll meet my 30 gauge. The proper way. He said, but if you come during normal hours, I'll give you in and I'll cook you a dinner. I said, very right. If you try to go into heaven any other way, there's one phrase for you. Depart from me for I never knew thee. I said, why is it that we can understand common sense stuff and understand that God has a specific way to get to his home? And we want to change it around. But we have a specific way to get in our home, and it's law. You come normal. But God, you know, he'll just let anybody in. We, you know, we just do this, contrary to what his rules are. This is what the world is doing blinding the minds of men believing a lie so that they think they're on their way to heaven and doing well that's what Matthew was saying have we not cast out demons in your name have we not prophesied in your name have we not done good works in your name have we not done all this and Jesus goes depart from me for I never knew thee that's the problem. There are a lot of preachers standing behind pulpits across the nations that do not know Jesus Christ, their personal Savior. There are a lot of quote unquote in pews that are goats. We've got to understand that Satan, and we learned this a couple weeks ago, talking about don't be surprised that he has angels of ministers of light as well. What are they doing? Helping people know about Christ? No. Just know enough about Christ 
to be religious and feel good. Like I said today, many are going to church because they feel good. Church is not a feely good experience. Church is to grow. And if you read the Bible in Timothy, he's commanding the preachers to rebuke, to correct, to instruct in all righteousness. There's nothing good about correction. It hurts. There's no instruction in righteousness. It's not what we want to see sometimes. Because why? As we talked this morning, the tug of war between the flesh and the spirit. The God of this world is a superior power, but not a deity. He's not God. His position, not his nature. It began in Eden and will continue this way until the curse is, is reversed in Revelation chapter 22 and verse 3. Satan is ultimately behind all false religions because he is the God of this world. Somebody asked me last week, why is there so many religions? I said, very simple. It's there to deceive man away from the true truth. Just simple as that. God of this world. Finally, I want you to see tonight King in Revelation 9 11. The king is given the key to the bottomless pit. He is the king over demons, just as he is the prince of the demons. In Matthew chapter 12, Matthew chapter 12 and verse 24. All of these denote that he is not just some chump that we can, as one commentator said, he's not a backyard bully. He is a bully, but it's not someone we can trifle with or take on ourselves. Christ leaves a specific way to fight the devil, not by bread alone, but by every word of mouth, word of God, every word of God. What's God's word? His Bible. I don't care how you slice it and dice it. We will never have the strength to take on the devil himself. We can do all things through Christ, but we can do nothing out of our own power. Matthew chapter 12 and verse 24, the Bible says, But when the Pharisees heard it, said, This fellow doth not cast out devils, but by Beelzebub, the prince of the devils. The word prince here is referring to a kingly position. He's the king over the demons. Just as he is Apollyon, Beelzebub, we all can also can refer to him, and we'll get on this next week, star. We know that he was a bright and shining star. And the Bible refers to him as a falling star. But he is the God of this world. He's the principality of the air. Next week we're going to look at him as the prince of demons. The prince and power of the air. He is the evil one. And the ruler of the world. All denotes how diabolical and cynical of a man, angel he is. That he is hostile to God. That he is desiring to ruin God's creation at all cost. He lives for destruction. I was reading through Revelation just the other day and you could see how much he hates man. You, you think about this. He has creation all to himself. The Holy Spirit is removed. God is removed from, you know, all God's people are gone. And what does he do? He punishes his people more on top of what God's wrath is doing. I'm like, hello? Shows you he doesn't care about mankind. They've just sworn allegiance to him and his minions. And yet it's said he does this. And what does he do? He releases the demons there and upon his people. He says that he does more and more and more. I mean, I, you the chapter all the stuff the devil himself does on top of what God unleashes 
And it shows you that he has no concern, no care for mankind, but their complete destruction. He wants them miserable. He's not concerned about our happiness and well-being. He'll make we think we're happy. But it's all an enslaving tool. Period. Keeps us on the hook for one more, one more, one more. Because he is, the Bible says, ruler of this world and those in it. And Christians, I pray that we are not easily entrapped by his snares. Let's be wise. And as the Bible says, walk circumspectly. Be sober. Be vigilant. He wants you to believe a lie. He wants to destroy you. He wants to destroy your family. He wants to destroy this church. And we must be on guard. Because the Bible says he is a destroyer. There's nothing good about him ever. Once upon a time, but when he sinned and fell, he became the epitome of evil. And it's not just the devil inside us. It's Satan all around us. And he's alive and well. And his goal is to destroy God. And he wants to. But I'm glad he never will be able to. He had his one bruising of the hill when Christ allowed himself to be crucified. But can you imagine the scream of hell when on that third day Christ arose with the keys of death and hell? Amen. What a day when we get to meet Christ face to face. Let's be ready. Let's pray tonight. Heavenly Father, thank you for your privilege of your word and how it explains in detail about our adversary. Lord, help us, as Peter says, to be vigilant, to be sober, that we may be on guard for the sneakiness of the devil. Thank you for reminding us, challenging us, equipping us. We give you the honor and the glory for all that you've done for us and watching over for us. Thank you for your protection. Thank you for your grace. Dismiss us with your blessing tonight to bring us back Wednesday night at 7. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Thank you so much for being here tonight. May the Lord bless you. Looking forward to seeing each and every one of you Wednesday night at 7 o'clock. Have a great week.